Eddie Rogers. Mr. Rogers, what age are you? you don't I'm 70. 70. Um, where are you from? I'm from a little village called Churchill. And where's that? Churchill is in West Fermanagh. Um, quite close to Derry Gonley, midway really between Balik and Enniskillen. There's a little loop road off the main Enniskillen to Balik Road, the main Ian 46 Road, and Churchill is just up in there. It's a, it's a very, very small village. Great, okay. Um, and what are you going to talk about with me today? Well, I'm going to talk really, my talk mainly based around Inish McSaint Parish Church mm-hmm. and um, the legacy really of the Ely family. Mm-hmm. And my interest in that really is because. We did a project with the Locker and Landscape Partnership on the church um, in the last two years, and that focused a lot of that focused on the Ely family uh-huh. and their influence on the local area, you know, and on the worshiping community of the church. So, you're going to tell me about the establishment of the church and sort of from its inception and how it became, um, and it's from its earliest period, or is it well, very broader briefly, than that? yes, yeah, the, is the, it broader the, the, than that. that? Uh-huh. It will be well mainly focusing on the on the sort of the eighteen hundreds. That's really Very good. Um, the bit that's the, 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 the more or less the interesting bit. Yeah. And there's a sort there's a lot lost, if you like, there. I mean with the especially with the Ely family because they don't exist anymore in this part of the world. Mm-hmm. Nobody, no living parishioner has any memory of them. And um, you know, had such a profound influence. Mm-hmm. So um, the project that we did wasn't really. It didn't really start off like that. Mm-hmm. It really started off. Um, we, we the Rock Iron Landscape Partnership came into existence, and they were giving grants of five thousand pounds. And um, really, what we wanted to, what we really wanted to do was, um, we wanted to do a bit of work on the graveyard. Ah. You know, this is it. Okay. Just I mean, go back a wee bit further. Maybe my own personal interest uh-huh. in this because. The, the local Inish McSean Parish Church is probably ingrained in my DNA, mm-hmm. really, because, um, well, I am a parishioner of the church. I'm also on the select vestry. My family has been in the area probably since 1600s, mm-hmm. and um, they have always had, uh, you know, a, a, a very close connection to the church. Plus the fact that, well, I'm probably the closest uh, parishioner lives who lives the closest to the church mm-hmm. of any. There are a couple of houses nearer. But they're not parishioners. So, I mean, I can look out my upstairs window and I can see the tower of the church. Every Sunday morning and I can hear the bell. And uh, I only have to travel, I mean, less than a quarter of a mile to get to the church. Also, as well, too, um, I own quite a lot of the leave lands of the church. I farm. What are the leave lands then? The leave lands were the lands that, that were sort of sold off at the time of disestablishment. Mm-hmm. That that church would have got an, uh, an income from. Mm-hmm. And then in the, the, the disestablishment, I can't remember the exact date, it was around about the 1870s, somewhere around about that. And so several of the glebe lands actually came into to my family, and I own actually you know, quite a bit of, of the glebe land. I also own the original rectory, which was, well, I don't own it, it's tumbled down now, but I own the buildings around it and I own the land on it. Yeah. And the, 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 still, the, the basis of it is still there, and it, the, the, pre, the, the not the present rectory, but the rectory before the present rectory was built in 1829. Mm-hmm. So that rectory would have the one that I on my land would have dated from the 1700s. Wow. So, um, so I so I'm sort of it's it's you have an invest, you have um, a vested interest in a vested it so many interest ways. There. It's basically in my DNA, if you like. Completely. Plus, my mother and father and all that would have been very very heavily involved in the church. Mm-hmm. And if you go back through even old church records, you know, there's even a. a you know, the, 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 this is a book that was uh, presented to Dean Tottenham, who I would like to talk a bit about as well yes. later on, and in appreciation of his work. And as you can see there at the top, one of the main signatures is Edward Rogers. Indeed. Who would have been one of my... That, that he would be actually my grandfather. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And as well, to a book that was produced as a result of our project. There was an article in The Impartial Reporter... Uh, in 1841, where somebody must have written an article um, running down the Marquis of Ely at that time, the second Marquis, and his his tenants. So <laughs> the tenants obviously got together. And there's a list of them as long as your arm um, to, to protest against this and to put an article in the paper. And the top name on it is Edward Rogers of Tolnagone, oh which, is, which is exactly where I live. It's, it's the same house. 
on the same name. So it's it's you know it goes back and back a long long. A lot time. of history. Yeah, a lot of history, you know. But it going back to the project anyway. We really wanted to do a bit of work on the graveyard yeah. because our graveyard runs down. There's a stream runs along the bottom of the graveyard, and that had become very much overgrown. Uh, just sc- general scrub and dirt. <coughs> the, the the that main stream had become blocked, and it was causing a lot of problems further back up. So we really wanted to clean that out and do a whole. And I thought now, when I looked at the, I'm sort of I fill up quite a few grant forms. Mm. I don't do this a professional right. or anything like that, but I've done quite a few. And I looked at the sort of the criteria and that sort of thing, and I said, you know, we, we drop into that because I think the thing was you had to be within a kilometre of yeah. the lake, which we yeah. are, or we're right beside the lake. And as well, too, it has to combine heritage and environment. Well, we had the environmental bit because we wanted to do a bit of work there to clean up and let the stream work. We wanted to improve the hedge and all that sort of thing. And then we had to put a, a heritage bit into it. So now we didn't, we hadn't thought of the Ely family at all. There was nothing to do with the Ely family, but we sort of looked at what, you know, how we would fit into that category. There are quite a few old headstones and graves in the graveyard that are not recorded. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows who's in them. And, of course, the main one is the vault. Well, we knew the vault had a connection to the Ely family, but there's no record of who's in the vault anywhere. And, I mean, they were obviously the most important people in the area, and yet there's nothing to say that they're there, you know. So we decided then that we would, you know, research some of the old gravestones and find out who was in the vault and erect a headstone. So which, that is what we did. Now, we didn't do the old graves the other old graves, because really COVID hit us between the yes. eyes. Uh, so we didn't get to in that part of the project. But what happened was we researched the vault all right, and that sort of led us on into the Ely family mm-hmm. and, and sort of stimulated our imagination. And it really moved then to a sort of a, a more of a, of a detailed study of the Ely family. Mm-hmm. And that's where they ended up, mm-hmm. actually, as a study of the Ely family and their influence. On, on the church and on the local community. So that's really where it all... Sounds uh, fascinating. And it was a fascinating project, actually, and, and I mean, everyone involved in it just couldn't couldn't believe, you know, mm-hmm. how, how well it turned out. And then, as a final bit, we opened the church on European Heritage last year, European Heritage Days, and we had a lot, a lot of visitors. Very good. And what amazed us most of all was that a lot of people who had maybe been in the church in the younger days and moved away and all that sort of thing, or maybe joined other churches, an awful lot of them came back. And, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was really, really interesting. You definitely lit a spark for a, oh, com- yes. a community abroad. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Great. Great. You know, this is it. So that really was, was in terms of the project, that, that's how it, how it uh, developed, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And um, it's the project now finished, obviously, with all just finished up. And um, but it's sort of centered then on the Ely family. Mm-hmm. Plus we widened it out a wee bit and we involved people like uh, from Annie Genealogy. Yes. And they produced this booklet here. Yes. So it is which um, well look, this is an old copy actually, it's not one of the newer ones. But they produced this here, which is a fairly detailed um you know uh, story of, of the Ely family yeah. in general. Yeah. And, yeah. and their whole Influence in Fermanagh. There, it threw up a few things that we were really sort of, uh, you know, um, we just didn't know how that fitted in because the Ely, I mean, the start of the Ely family in this area really um, came about with the second Marquis. And what? Because he, 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 he built Ely Lodge, which was their residence. And um, before that, I think they're, they're mainly based in Wexford, you see. The, the, mm-hmm. the, and well, you can go back further to Nicketh of the Humes, who were the family who were given a lot of land here at the time of the um, plantation. Mm-hmm. They go back to the 1600s. And one of the, the, the one of the Ely mar- married one of the Humes. Mm-hmm. And the, that was the next line of descent in the Hume family. So they inherited a fantastic amount of land from the Humes. So that really, and then the second Marquis, he built Ely Lodge, which was their main, main house. And was that in Derry Gonnelly? No, that, that's out, it's out on the, on the shore road. The, the strange thing about it is that they are actually in the parish of Manet, which is the neighbouring parish. Their, mm-hmm. their house is actually, the old Ely Lodge, was actually in the parish of Manet. But yet, 
they seem to to associate with ancient saint for some reason. And I'm not sure why that is. And um, like I remember now my father and all talking about now that he would have never really known any of the Ely family. But in the church there was always the Ely pew where the, where the family sat. Um, it had its own entrance. You know, they didn't go in through the, the ordinary person's entrance to the church. They had their own entrance. Elite. Elite. It's raised yes. above the, every other else. You know, the commoners sat down below. They sat up that bit higher that mm-hmm. it was raised up. There was a fireplace. They had their own fireplace. Um, so it, it, could, it was always lit by the servants during the services. Mm-hmm. The, the, there's an old building down um, just beside the church. It was always called the stables. And that's where their, their horses mm-hmm. were stabled. Um, so they, they, you know, they were really, you know, when they came to church... They came to church, yeah. you know what I mean? They didn't just come on their own. They probably would have bought half a dozen servants with them. There had to be somebody to look after the horses. There had to be somebody to light the fire. There had to be somebody to make sure everything was just right. And um, so that really was, uh, you know, they, they were very, very, I mean, they owned a lot of land. So they really know. were classed as members of the elite oh, very aristocracy much so. and, and oh, yes. whatever the words would That's be. That's right. Yeah. And I mean... Um, I'm not sure if the second mark was his wife or not, but one of their wives anyway was actually a lady in waiting to the queen. Really? Oh yes. Wow. Uh huh. So um, so they had a lot of influence mm. now. Definitely had a lot of influence. And um, but if you go back to the the church itself, <coughs> the original church was on East McSaint Island. Mm-hmm. That that's where it started off. Okay. Um, with Saint Ninnit. I mean, it's, it's, the church is called Saint Ninnit. And um, so it started on East McSaint. He was one of uh, he would have been. St. Columbus, you know, mm-hmm. that, that generation. And he built an abbey on the island. And the remains of it are still there in the church. And there is a cross as well there, which is supposed to... The, the folklore is that every Easter Sunday morning, it's cross towards right round. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people now who have camped on the island, but I haven't heard tell of anybody seeing it as yet. I think maybe there's a few heads turning right now. <laughs> Never mind. Well, that could be it as well. But um, then... The next church then was built by the Humes. It was built in the village of Churchill. Really, which I mean, I live right beside Churchill. It's, it's, um, it was one of the main villages um, in front of Fermanagh was planted. There were supposed to be three main towns in Fermanagh, and Churchill was supposed to be one of them. But it went into the decline. I mean, Church is a very, very small village now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there isn't even a shop in it. Right. There's a Methodist church, and that's it, and a few houses. So it's, it's very, very... You know, it's not a, it's only a hamlet, really. Yeah. And uh, so it never really developed. So it didn't. I think maybe there was an outbreak of cholera or something like that at some stage. Aye. Which maybe had an effect, you know. But but then the next uh, church then, by the Hume family, was built in Churchill. So that's where it was. And it was in 16, around about the 1620s or somewhere around that it was built. It was just a very basic thatched building, mm-hmm. you know, as far as mm-hmm. I can. Now, there, there are only a few stones remaining of it. And the graveyard is still there, but there's no headstones around. Mm-hmm. There might be stones just to mark graves, but that's really it. And then from then it moved to the present church, mm-hmm. which was um, built in any, any, you know, down at where, where yes. the present church in Benbow, where the present church is now. Um, there is a st- well, it's not, it's a true story actually, that where the present church was built, there was a family lived on that particular site, and they were actually moved from the site. And they were given land in another part of the, of the, um, you know, of the Ely estate, because that was all part of the Ely estate. But it, it created quite a bit of bad feeling. There's actually yeah, yeah. a book written about it. So and there is. They seemed very determined to have the, the, the church built there for whatever the, reason, the, really, the, the rector at that time was <laughs> Reverend Hugh Hamilton. And he was very a very, very determined man, from what I can make out, you know. And he picked that area, he picked just where he wanted to put the church, and that was it. There was no, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> there was no negotiation or yeah. anything like that. And uh, that family were given, the family still exists, I mean, mm-hmm. they're still around. But again, at that particular time, the Methodists were just starting to to come in, and there was a bit of tension between Methodists and Church of Ireland. Yes. Because at that time, they reckoned that the Church of Ireland had got away from the gospel, that they weren't there preaching, just wasn't. You know um, that they were, you know, that that is sort of the focus more on community 
than they did on, on spiritual matters, if you like. And what time period would this have been around? That would have been, that's the early 1800s. 1800s, yeah. Because uh-huh. the church was built in 1831, the rectory was built in 1829. Yeah. That was the current, the, the, well, it's not the current rectory, it's, it's the one before the current one, but still exists in all its glory. Yeah. And is now owned actually by the physio of Chelsea Football Club. <laughs> that's, that's who lives there at the minute. And they have restored it completely. It's, it's a lovely, lovely big building, right enough. And then in 1831, the church was built. Now, that, that was a major, major, when you think back, undertaken at that time. You know, to build those two buildings really? yeah. within a matter of years. But they were both built with a loan from what they call the First Fruits Fund. And that was a fund that existed, and quite a bit of, of government money was put into it. Yeah. And if you go back, I mean, you look at a lot of the churches, or enough of the church building went on around that mid 1800s mm-hmm. time, everywhere. Yeah. And a lot of the money, I think, for that came from that fund. Now you can get a loan from that fund, and the way the church was built was the parish um, paid four fifths of the loan. I say a lot of of. Um, church building went on at that time um, so then the, the, that's that's the present church it still exists and um, again this is where the sort of the link between the landed gentry and the church and the church clergy mm-hmm. because there seems to be a, a lot of uh, connection you know yeah. if you were part of the landed gentry nearly one one his career path was to go into the church mm-hmm. and the the Ailies were, were also were like that because when the church was dedicated, it was the second Marcus's brother. Mm-hmm. He was Lord Robert Ponsonby. And uh, so, um, now he was Tottenham. You see, there's this thing of the names, the surnames, because the Ely surname is Loftus. Then the, the line died out a couple of times, but th- their cousins were Tottenham's. So there was that, they, then the Tottenham's had to change their name, so they became Tottenham Loftus. So there's that change over a couple uh-huh, of times, uh-huh. actually, in their history. Um, because it just the, 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 the current markers had no, had no issue. Mm-hmm. So they had to move on into a different line. And they were Tottenham, so it's always talking about the, the Loftus Tottenham. Mm-hmm. So it is, so that's, so, but he was, to the, the, the second Marcus's brother was Tottenham. Mm-hmm. He was Lord Robert Constantly Tottenham, and he was the Bishop of Clapper. And he dedicated the building. So there's that connection uh-huh. all yeah. the time. And you go a little bit further down then, to his son yeah. was also a uh, Church of Ireland clergyman. That, that's the Bishop of Clapper. His son, who was rector of the parish from 1865 to 1903, almost 40 <clears throat> years, he was one of the longest in Compasses that there has been. And he was, like, his legacy lives on because a lot of things that he did you know, that still that had a profound influence on the parish and on the area. So, um, Are you going to explain a wee bit more about those things? Or? Yeah, well, he, he as I say, um, he, he, he served from 1865 to 1903. Um, he saw the parish through disestablishment, mm-hmm. which was made massive, massive mm-hmm. changes because their income really dropped away down. Because if before that, everybody paid to the Church of Ireland, regardless of what your religion was. But once that happened, then that all stopped. And plus, they, they then they didn't get that many, that much uh, income from the leave lands as well. And I think that's why some of the leave lands probably were sold off. Um, but the Marcus of that time, was the fourth Marcus of that time, he got compensation because it cut his income down as well. He got three, over £3,000 of compensation. And he then built the chancel. There's no chancel in the church. He built the chancel, the existing chancel on, which is probably one of the main features of the church at the present time. He built it on himself, using that money. And I also think, now we're not sure about this, that that this is, is, there's nobody to back this up. They also think that the tower of the church was built at that time. There's a a, a tower on the outside. And um, they think it was built at that time. They're not sure about that, but the church was renovated in 2004. Right. And during those renovations, the back wall of the church collapsed beside the tower. Okay. So they discovered then the tower's not, not tied in. So it must have been put on afterwards. Okay, yeah, it, that it, would it, make it, sense. It wasn't tied in. Now, it was a miracle nobody was killed because the entire back wall collapsed. 
and the workmen who were working at it, they were taking their tea at the time. Oh, yeah. They were up at the very front of the church taking their tea. And I mean, if, if they had been working, they were working picking the wall. And if they had been, you know, if they had been doing their, what they were doing 10 to 20 minutes beforehand, some of them would have been killed. You're saying picking the wall, is that like taking out the old mortar? Taking out the old mortar. And um, there was a major renovation project mm-hmm. done in 2004. And um, a lot of it was dry lined with old Hessian sacks. And it was all taken down and then they re dry lined it again on the new and re plastered it and did a fairly major job on it. But they didn't, it wasn't written into the contract that the back wall had to be rebuilt. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a miracle, really, that they ended um, up live out of it. It was, <laughs> exactly. And I mean, they had to actually take off a portion of the roof to get a, a mini digger inside to actually clear the rubble because wow. couldn't, couldn't get in. You know, because the, the, this rubble was built up. You know, they paid for all that work then. Well, the church had to pay for it. I mean, it, it did cost extra, sure but they, they, they had to pay for it. Yeah. It was just part of it. It was all paid for it, actually. So the fabric of that church, as it was, that, and then renovated, didn't overly change in any great way, did it? Or was it sort of, as it was built, but just modified? And, modified. And, the, the, and the chancel was added on, yeah. and possibly the tire. We don't know that for that. Yeah. But the chancel was definitely added on. It was Andrew the Fourth Marquis built that. Plus, when he did that, the east window in the church is, is probably the most, you know, impressive stained glass window in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, it was dedicated in memory of the second Marquis, which would have been his father. Um, and um, it was it, it's a fairly like it, it's a three arched window, you know, a fair a big big window. And um, so it was it was dedicated. To the second in memory of the second Marcus and his wife, you know, and yes. by, by their children, that's all that's all still inscribed there, you know. Lovely. So that was, and I'll say that's the most impressive window in the church. And um, so that really was it was uh, extended at that time, and has remained, remained the same more or less ever since. Can I? Um, it is one hundred percent relevant to this. I just wanted to ask you something maybe a bit more personal about the whole thing. In terms of your earliest memories of the church, and maybe your earliest memories of, of being taken to church or going to church in 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 um in a sh- mixed uh-huh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um and some of the some of your earliest memories about it. Really. Right. Well, uh, I obviously, I mean, I I was born. <laughs> yes. I was christened in the church. <clears throat> I mean, I was confirmed in it. I went to Sunday school in it. And uh, so, I mean, I was brought to church from really, probably, now, nowadays, children of journey brought to church as babies. That obviously didn't happen. I mean, in my day, well, the first thing you was Sunday school. That was your first, and you went to it, probably the same time as you went to school. You were brought around about four. And in my early days, now, the Sunday school was quite big. There would be 70 or 80 children there, at least. And nowadays, I mean, you're down to basically a handful, really. But at that time, that's... So that really was my first experience of the church going to Sunday school. And then my parents would have been fairly regular church goers all the time. My father, he, he was on the select vestry and he sang in the choir as well. My mother would have been a Sunday school teacher at, no, not for a long time. She would have, oh, there's a girls friendly society. Mm-hmm. She would have been a founder of it. Mm-hmm. And so she was involved in it. And she also would have played the organ mm-hmm. off and on. And in those days, the way it always worked was that women didn't always go to church. Mm-hmm. You know, they mm-hmm. went, the men always went. Nowadays, it's the other way around. Mm-hmm. But in those days, the men, especially in the morning service, the men always went. And the women basically had to stay at home and make the dinner. Uh-huh. That was the way it was. But in our house, now, I'm an only child. I don't have any brothers or sisters, so it's only me. But the way it worked in our house was that my father went, always went to church on Sunday morning. Regularly went to church on Sunday morning. Like it was part. It was, yes. There was no question. It was the most important thing on a Sunday morning. But my mother always went out on Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> so I was generally brought to both services. <laughs> so that, that was the way it, it, it tended to work. And of course the service on Sunday night was always you know, a lot smaller congregation than it would have been um, on, a, on a Sunday morning. So that's my earliest memories. Mm-hmm. And then just growing up through the Sunday school really. Because the Sunday school, it was, it was very akin... Um, to, 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 to normal school. I, I'm sort of thinking like even the size of the church as you grew up did you see the church getting smaller and 
Did you see changes physically within the church and the fabric of it, or how things were used in the church, like and you know different aspects of it, like that? Not really, as such. Not really. I mean, the thing is basically the same as it was yeah. then. I didn't notice any. The only difference would be the number of people. You know, I mean, on a Sunday morning, I mean, the church was was full, and um, again, as I say, uh, men. You know, that that's the big difference that I see is that I mean, sort of the the, the leading families in the church. I mean, the men were were the, the they were there every Sunday. I mean, mm-hmm. Men would have outnumbered women mm-hmm. easily on a Sunday morning. Easily, normally the women were maybe teenage girls, um, and the Sunday school. The, the, the part and parcel of going to Sunday school was you went to church as well. Yes. Nowadays, a lot of the, the, the services, the, the, the children maybe stay for the start of the service, and the end, you know, then they would go out maybe to a different room or something like that for Sunday school. But their Sunday school was before the, the service. It we our service was always half eleven, mm-hmm. and Sunday school was half ten, and you always went um, half ten to Sunday mm-hmm. school, and you didn't. I mean, normally it was one o'clock then before the service finished, mm-hmm. so you were there from half ten to one o'clock. Now in between. There was always now the, the Sunday school stopped at quarter past eleven, and then there was play time. And I mean, where did we play? Only in the graveyard. That's 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 where we were the play. Tell us a bit more about that. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, the vault was actually <laughs> came into use at that particular time as well, um, because that's now it was locked all right, right enough. But that's you know we used to actually the vault on the side. The vault is. is Basically dug into the uh-huh. ground, and there are two banks on each uh-huh. side, and then it means it's on inside. It's a wonderfully designed building, mm-hmm. you know, stone and brick. But we used to be jump from the banks down <laughs> into the the, the, the laying in. You know, we sort of had jumps and that sort of thing down, and um, the stream as well. We used to go down and, and I mean, moving health and safety was no, not thought about. And we went down to the stream, and we'd actually crossed over the stream, and we'd mm-hmm. be playing in the fields beside it. And then the old rectory as well, we'd have been at at some stage. I mean, it was closed at that uh, particular time. And there was just an ordinary family lived in it. But we would have went up there at times as well, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we just roamed wild, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then all got into church. And plus, in fact, in church, I mean, you did not look sideways. I mean, you didn't speak. You know, there was no, if, if you were seen talking. I mean, the rector in my time, who was there for a long time as well, I mean, he would have actually stopped the service yeah. if somebody was talking, and he would yeah. have actually blared at them. Yeah. And um, so that's, and then as I grew up, then I grew up, as I say, in the, you know, um, I would have been, you know, went to confirmation classes yeah. and all that sort of thing and been confirmed. And then I would, I went to university for four years. I mean, I'm a farmer now, now that's what I do. I farm, yeah. but I went to university. And, um, I, you know, but I was home not every weekend, but every second weekend. What university did you go to? Queens. Uh-huh. I, I did a course that's now long defunct. Mm-hmm. I was in the agricultural faculty. Uh-huh. That's an it's long gone now, of course. Um, I graduated in 1974. Okay. So that was it. And I also, when I was at university, I, for one year I stayed in the Church of Ireland Centre. Oh, very interesting. So um, that was it, but... The person who was in charge of the Church of Erin Centre at that time actually came from Fermanagh here, so <laughs> that maybe was one of the reasons I'm not mm-hmm. sure. <clears throat> but then, as I said, you know, I came back then, I, I came home to farm as soon as I finished university because I said I don't have any brothers or sisters and nobody else is to go to the farm. Uh, my father's health wasn't that good at the time, and um, so I came home to basically took over the farm. And within a few years, I mean, I was back on the select. I was on the select vestry, and I've nearly been on it ever since. Yeah. You know, I was very, very young, and I was also church warden when I was yeah. probably in my early twenties as well. At that time, I was sort of snapped up, if you like. But um, so that's really my sort of history with the church, and I say I've been involved with it yeah, ever yeah. since. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, I put a lot of emphasis on the the community aspect of the church. Yes. You know, I mean, I obviously wouldn't go unless there was a spiritual aspect, but I wouldn't describe myself as a an overly devout Christian, if you know what I mean. But, I mean, I do. That's the reason I go. I yeah, really believe that, that worship is very, very important. But the community aspect is also very important to me. And some and people would say that as being uh, the primary reason why a lot of people would maybe go to a community church and, uh-huh. um, and spiritualism. 
comes part and parcel with that. That's right. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. But I mean, Inishmac Saint has always been a church that um, you know the community is very much involved mm-hmm. in the community. And when you go back to those earlier days in the eighteen hundreds, the, the, the church would basically have controlled the community. Yeah. You know, they would everything that anything that happened in the community, the church were involved in it to the two years really. Um, I mean, in this book here, they give a report of a concert uh, that was held in Derry Gonley. Because Derry Gonley is the nearest village, uh-huh. you see, to the church, in sort of reasonable sized village. And um, they, the the concert, it was basically organised as far as I, and this is going back to Dean Totten again, because he was the main participant in, in the concert, plus his daughters. They're all, they're all, you know, heavily involved, and they sang this, and they sang now. There's a report, you know, it's about four pages long, detailing everybody that did anything, <laughs> and they must have been there all night, <laughs> because everybody seemed to get an encore. And the last verse had always be sung twice, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how they, how they managed, you know, to to um, sit through all that really. But no, they they were the, the church would be involved very very much so in. Yeah. The local yeah. as well, you know. And can you yeah. mem do you do you mind the church in, in, in that aspect in a fond way from your time and sort of its involvement in the community as you grew up? Oh yes, I uh-huh. And the rector that was there at that time, I mean he was there for love well, he was Archdeacon Skuse and he was there for a long number of years and he was very much involved in the local community, very, very much so. And he really pushed that aspect of it, you know. I mean, anything that was going on in the local community, he was involved in it, and he organised an awful lot of events. So the events. thing, well, they used to have a summer festival, yeah, um, which was organised on the shores of Loch Erne in a big field. I remember being at two of them, and I mean, they were major, major events. Um, you know, the amount of things that was going on yeah. at that particular time. He's a bit of a legend in his own way because he had his own cinema mm-hmm. in Derry Gunley. He bought an old Nissan hut after the war, oh. and it, he got it put up just in, uh, outside the village. And every Friday night, he, he was he was into cine films and that sort of thing, big time. There's a, he's actually featured. There's a program. Do you ever remember? Was it Gloria Honeyford of old films? What I can't remember the name of it. They went round all Northern Ireland. It was the BBC. It was. I would need to look it up, but it was. Something rings the bell. Possibly. Uh-huh. Well, his films were shown uh-huh. actually at that, the one in the, here in, in uh, Scotland. Mm. So, but he he has he had his own cinema every Friday night, and he had cinema seats and all in this Nissan hut. He bought old cinema seats, and were very you know. Did he charge entrance? Oh, aye, <laughs> and sold sweets and all the rest too. Chicken. Oh, well, the whole works. And I mean, I'm talking going back. I mean, I went to those on my bicycle. Mm-hmm. When I was about, you know, nine or ten, mm-hmm. I'm up to probably about fifteen, right about that particular mm-hmm. time. So he was a bit of a legend in that mm-hmm. respect. Plus every other event that was going on in the, in the community, he he was very very heavily involved in it. So there was those he organised those summer festivals. I also remember him organising stock car racing, oh, wow. <laughs> which was <laughs> a bit of a you know a turn up for the books, mm. and. The only time I think that he maybe got into a wee bit of trouble was <coughs> he um, trouble with the church. And well, the not, overstepping. <laughs> not with the church as such, but with the local community. Okay. Maybe with the other churches uh-huh. more so. He organised as a fundraising event. He organised an night of bingo. Oh, I can see it. And this is gambling. I know. Well, this is going back to about the the, the I would say probably about the um, 1960s. Uh-huh. And it was organised. He was actually quite closely involved with the local Orange Order. Uh-huh. So he was. And um, together with them, they organised a bingo session. And um, it, it caused ructions. Absolute ructions. So it did. Of course, because Methodists, everybody went yeah. to the, you know, yeah. those things. And, um, but that was the one and only one. It never happened again. <laughs> Lesson learned. That's right. And then, as fundraising events, I mean, they had the sales of work. Every year there was still a year was still at work, yeah. and um, just we had stores and that sort of thing. And I remember like the hall of those were packed, and that's Absolutely everything from home baked goods to the farming equipment to to animals. Everything, to everything. Ne- nearly. Well, not so much, but mainly second hand clothes that sort of thing. And then there was always, you know, um, a shooting match, you know, with with air rifles and that sort of thing. 
and then there was sort of uh, bean bags, mm-hmm. you know, the games, darts, all that, all that type of thing, you know. And I mean, I used to look, I remember as, as a child, I used to look forward to those mm-hmm. for months and months, you know, ahead. Oh, planet at all. That's right. Yeah. And um, like they were big, big nights. I mean, nowadays children wouldn't wouldn't appreciate that sort of thing at all. Well, I'd say after our COVID expeditions in the last two years, if you were to, to say that it was a huge festival, that's right. It'd be uh, it'd be like back to the earth nearly for people that's to right. do something like that. That's very, right. Very nurturing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and community driven. Really within a smaller environment, not that's necessarily right. in the centre of Enniskill. Oh no, that's right. Uh huh. But those events now attracted a lot, a lot of people. Then people were easier amused in those days, yes. and people went out a lot more, you know, sort of around people's houses and that sort of thing as well. So a, a sort of something bigger like that, yeah. they, they, they flocked to it, you know. Yeah. Um, but I remember in the old Orange Hall, not in concerts, mm-hmm. and you wouldn't have got moving. Uh-huh. Jam packed and the dances and stuff. That's right. And I mean, oh, when you looked, we as, as young boys used to sit on the windowsills uh-huh. because there were no seats. <laughs> you had to sit in the window so, and you looked out and all you could see was a blue haze of cigarette smoke. <laughs> That's <laughs> all you could see. Because <laughs> it was the done thing for it's smoking. Oh, I and inside that, you know, that everybody that smoked was smoking. Yeah. You know, this is the thing. And, um, you know, when you think of the house, things have changed since oh. that. You know. For the better, though, with our smoking. Well, exactly. Time. That was one thing that I thought was... was was definitely a good a good law, you know, no doubt, and people accepted it almost without any problem, you know. I think so. It's one of the small things, one of the few things, not small, one of the few things that's been brought into society that has been welcomed, really. That's right, exactly. So, yes, and, exactly. and for good reason, because that's people right. realise, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right, you know. But um, I don't know if you wanted George Tottenham, we were talking earlier on about... Um, George Tottenham yes. because he was probably one of the most legendary um, rectors that they had <coughs> and um, because he saw them through um, disestablishment yes. you know when, when the income fell and they thought at that time that basically the church was nearly finished because the income they were basically on their knees you know, the income dropped away yeah. down, but he sort of got people stirred up and that sort of thing and the idea of supporting your own church you know and, and making it viable financially sort of you know, that was the thing that, mm-hmm. that sort of came out of that, really, that every church had to look after itself. And, um, but he lived in the old rectory, at, um, which is just directly across the road from the church. Um, the church is on this side of the road, in the rectory, yeah. and, and uh, an old avenue there. <coughs> and um, <coughs> there's quite a bit of information on him, you know, and a lot of old photographs. And the people who live there at the minute, who say is the Physio of Chelsea Football Club, they have a tremendous in- interest and they have okay. a lot of old photographs and that sort of thing that um, actually things even found in the rectory. But um, another thing that he did, he obviously saw the church as well through the famine. And that was a very, that very, mean, yeah. that was a very, very major, um, you know, impact on the community. And that was actually the birth, the birth of Finnish McSean Place. Um, because that was the, the it was a bit of income for some of the girls, you know, the young women yes. in the parish. And now that was done at various places through um, Ireland at the time. But his wife was uh, from Miss McLean, mm-hmm. originally from Tynan. And lace, there was quite a bit of lace making started in Tynan. And when they got married, she had two unmarried sisters who came to live with them. In, in the rectory in Van Moor, and they were lace makers. So they started this cottage industry of any same place. Mm-hmm. And um, it became very, very famous, actually. Queen Victoria and Queen Alexandra both had any same place um, on their wedding dresses. And it was sold, a lot of it was sold um, to America. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a very, very viable industry. Mm-hmm. But it was them that started that off. And that, again, the church was involved in that in a lot of other places yeah. as well. Not only in Carrick Macross, there's all the laces, all, a whole range of laces. But Inish McSaint, it was, you know, they all had, were unique in their own yes. way. And Inish McSaint place was, was unique in this way. So um, 
he was, you know, that's another thing that in his in his time that was started and ended up very very successful. Mm-hmm. But then in the nine, basically it went on to about the nineteen twenties, and then it just went downhill. Declined. Declined. They said that it was an um, earthquake in San Francisco. That was one of the main influence on it because that was one of the main. They they, they exhibited quite regularly at the, at the World Trade Fair. Yeah. And there's actually, in the Tottenham family at the minute, there's still some of the Tottenham around. They have a, a, a poster from the, 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 the New York Trade Fair. Uh, okay. Or for Edge it was where it was evident. So it was a very, very important um, aspect to the local area. It gave a lot, a lot of employment. And of course, they could bring it home, you see. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um, there's actually at the minute, I have a connection to that as well, because in our family that actually came down, not directly now from any of our direct descendants, but from somebody, you know, who I'm related to very, very way out, we actually have a piece of an Ishmael in place, <coughs> a, a proper full collar. Now, I wouldn't like to put a value on it, yeah. um, because there are very, very few collars made. Oh, where is it? Is it in the house somewhere? What's in the house? We have it in the house. No, the museum. We're not giving it the museum. <laughs> the the um, is it Linda Ballard from the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum was very very keen to get it, mm-hmm. but the lady that gave it to us told us never let it out of her sight and mm-hmm. never to let it leave the house. Mm-hmm. So it's there, but we have it. It's been photographed and all that. Good. A lot of. But just my wife is an, an interest in that as well because um, there's actually a group that she's involved in her now right now.